Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the women's show here at Civic Space TV. And today we want to talk about the refugee crisis in Uganda. Um, in the past two weeks, we've had over 15,000 refugees cross over into Uganda and some into the Rwanda area. But the critical question is to whether they're getting the services that they need in terms of making sure that you know they can survive. But then also, what does that speak for the region? We also want to interrogate issues around um, sustainability, issues around peace within the region. And I have two amazing ladies to help me have this conversation. I have on the far left, Dr. Sarah Sally. Welcome to the show. Yes, please. And thank you for always being here with us. Yes. And then I have Naima here to help me, Naima Issa, to help me also deal with the different issues around the refugee crisis. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. I know there, there are a lot of things happening within Uganda. Yeah. But what tickled me over the weekend was that the refugee crisis, especially with the closure of the transit center, is something we need to start to have an honest conversation on how we are dealing with it or how we are planning mm. to you know, hold it. And in, in making sense of that, I thought this was ideal to have you guys who are working in these areas help us understand, you know, what, that, what, what is that? What does that mean for the refugee communities? But then also for us as Ugandans, and maybe to bring you in in this conversation, Naima, because you have, you know, worked with them, had conversations with them. When we speak about an influx, mm -hmm. what does that mean for us as Ugandans in how we prepare ourselves? No, oh, okay. Thank you very much for that question. I acknowledge that uh, the past couple of weeks with the war in Kivu, mm -hmm. like um, it's a crisis that we have to. We are receiving refugees in vast amounts. Uh, like uh, I think I was reading the Daily Monitor, and uh, they were saying that uh, we're receiving roughly fifty to sixty refugees daily. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a crisis in our country, yeah. especially because. At the moment, we as citizens are not getting the services that we need. Yes. So if you, you get to have 60 people daily trickling in the country, if you look at Nyakabanda, um, the recipient yeah, area yeah, for, yeah. for refugees, mm -hmm. they're spending billions of money to sustain refugees mm -hmm. there. And I think that's one of the reasons yeah. it's closing. Yeah. They, they don't know what to do about it. And if you look at what the refugees are saying is they don't want to be resettled, they want to settle at Nyakawanda, and the government is saying, let's move them to Nachivale yes. where there's like yes. more services mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Others have opted to go back, which that. to me is sad. Uh, they're trying to run away from a crisis, war, yes. uh, rape, defilement, and all the atrocities that follow with the war. So them opting to go back, it means we are failing it, in, in a way. To choose to yeah. die. So they choose mm -hmm. to die rather mm -hmm. than... Um, because of the poor services. So closing the settlement to me is not a solution, but trying to uh, mitigate how best they can handle the situation mm. to see that they can give refuge to people who are coming. Um, you saying that I'd rather go back and die, then that is a sad, mean, it means you're hopeless and you'd rather die than come and have a sorry state. Mm. So what it means to our country is looking and saying, what is it that we can do better? Yeah. Because Uganda is known as a country that uh, is a refugee-friendly country, and we host, I think, the biggest number of refugees yes, in the whole of we Africa. We have the biggest refugee camp. Uh, so, yeah. a country that is known for that needs to plan better. UNHCR needs to to you know discuss with the government on how best can they handle such a situation. Mm -hmm. And as an East African community, it's also a challenge on how prepared we are to receive refugees. I remember when the Afghanistan refugees were coming, the government was really prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, but then what's happening with the Congo? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we doing something similar to that to receive that amount? So, yeah, something has to be done. Oh, yeah. And maybe to bring Dr. Sarah into this conversation, um, one of the critical issues that comes out of that, but even for Uganda mm -hmm. as a country, is they're saying we are being underfunded. And UNHCR is also, and partners at the influx level do not have the quite the, quite the, like the big or the necessary funding mm -hmm. to host this influx or to host the refugees that are coming. When it comes to, 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 to providence of funds and, and services, how best prepared can we be as a country? Or what other entities can come on board to help, you know, cushion, you know, the finance areas when it comes to refugee response okay 
Thank you very much, Gloria. Mm -hmm. And uh, good afternoon, those who are viewing. The issue is, first of all, we have to understand who funds refugees. Yeah. The funding of refugees is never a national government matter. Mm -hmm. It is a UNHCR yeah. matter. So what the UNHCR needs to do is to say, what are our principles? What do we stand for? Yeah. And how are we ready to walk the talk? And the, it's interesting you made a comparison with the American, no, the Afghan yeah. refugees yes. who were headed to the yeah. US. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure who financed their repatriation here yeah. Yeah. in preparation for to, to the away. US. Yeah. So I don't know whether this was a US arrangement or a UNHCR arrangement. Yeah. Yeah. But I know in the past, there used to be a comparison between what African refugees got from yeah. the UN yeah. and what the Kosovo refugees got from yes. the UN. Yes. The African refugees had a, a number of beans, a kilo of posho, mm. and they looked like they were African refugees, yeah. really. Yeah. And the Kosovo people were getting tents, they were getting blankets. Blankets, yes, shoes. Yes. So people are like, look here. It's the same entity, the yeah. UNHCR, mm -hmm. but then services. different mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. So it is also true that with the current crisis in the world, and basically we saw the major funding cuts mm -hmm. for refugees in Uganda yeah. from the UNHCR yeah. with the first lockdown, yes. 2020, yes. where they, I think even the 13,000 was cut to something much less, yeah. to something like around three five. Mm -hmm. And it was a crisis. How are these people going to survive? to survive? What is the UN thinking about? So I think as a country, we have done well to provide mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. No other country on this continent is. takes refugees yes. like that. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing Uganda does, and there's a study from Oxford University which actually showcased Uganda's refugee policy as the best in the world. Wow. It mm -hmm. allows them to come in to fend for themselves and to survive. Yeah. If you're a refugee and you have skills okay. in Uganda, you're allowed to leave the camp. Mm. That's why we have a very big population yeah. of urban refugees. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who tailor the Tenge are mm. Congolese yes. refugees. Yes. So they're being given an opportunity. Mm. In other places, once you're a refugee, you're a refugee and you're you a survivor of camp. UNHCR and mm. World Food Program. Yeah. So I think this now goes back to how the UN organizes its things and organizes the principles. Mm. Because if the Uganda government, as she said, is struggling to provide for its own people, yeah. it would be a bit hard pressing to ask it to take care yeah. of Congolese refugees. Yeah, sure. But I think beyond the refugee thing, we should also ask ourselves why are they always coming, yes. especially from the yes. DRC. And I think now this is where our governments in the Great Lakes region have to come up and say, why are we? Because beyond the refugee crisis, they have leverage mm. over this country yeah. at a political mm. level. Mm. And that should be also done to stop the influx. But other than that, I think the UNHCR needs to walk the talk, treat refugees in the world the same way, yeah. and provide for these people. Sure. Of course, I don't know the detail. I know I've read the details of Nyakavande in the mm. news, of course, there are two scenarios. First of all, being so close, I think the refugee wants to be so close to home. So close mm. to home so that once the fighting stops, they yes. can go home. Because the other thing we never think about is this, the mental toll yes. conflict and displacement brings on a people. Yeah. So they always hope to return. That's yeah. why they want to be nearest yeah. home as possible. Mm. But I think the UNHCR is trying to communicate that with all these things around the country, these camps, it cannot afford another one. Yeah. Of course, on the safety side, depending on where M23 is, yeah. also having a resettlement camp close, close to, to the, the border. Borders. Normally, it's yes. also not advisable yes. because you, we've had cases in other parts of the world where the fighting forces overrun these camps yeah. and mm -hmm. pick the people they want. And then the Uganda government and the UNHCR will have to explain more. Yeah. So I think in brief, that's what I can say. I think refugee funding is a UNHCR matter yeah. and the UN has resources let them prioritize African refugees like they do refugees elsewhere. Thank yes. you. Um, maybe then, Naima, let me bring you in there. The fighting stopped in the end of March, and it has just returned. With mm. a semblance of months of peace, it has returned. But I know even before that, there was a, there was a conversation that happened in Kenya in creating the East African Military Task Force. Mm. And even 
they tried to have peace talks. And while the peace talks were happening, there was a break in, in new fighting within the region. And in this, in this category, the president of Congo was saying Rwanda was now funding the M23 to, mm. to break close again, allegedly funding. And fast forward, we are at the, at the brick of new fighting. And seemingly, this time, the, M, the M23 was are saying it's government attacking us. I, I say that to say this. Why is it that, you know, fighting in Congo seems to be a constant cycle? And how is it that years later, many years later, over 20, 25 or 26 years later, mm. Congo seems to be the place that won't stop fighting. Okay. Uh, so with the little knowledge and research I've done, I think Kivu is the area that is really blessed yeah. with minerals. Yeah. Uh, the gold diamond is found in Kivu. And uh, if, if the M23 saying that, uh, sorry, the government of Congo saying that Rwanda allegedly is funding the M23, yeah. to me I think this uh, is in relation to interest for uh, the economic interest that Kivu yeah. has. Mm -hmm. And I think this is my personal opinion. M23 is trying to say, you know what, these are our minerals we're protecting. If you're going to mine out of this, we should be able to benefit out of this mm -hmm. and develop as a country, which might be their standpoint on why they're fighting mm -hmm. with the government. But now, what saddens is the fact that as East African countries that were supposed to contribute to the peacemaking of that area, mm -hmm. if the allegations that we are contributing to the war, mm -hmm. then there's a lot to, to, to rethink mm -hmm. on why then are we interested in that war. What is it that the other countries are benefiting out of that war? Yeah, yeah, it could be something that is a war, but there might be hidden agenda yes, as yes. to why the war is ongoing. Yeah. So I think, uh, as the East African community, we need to sit and be deliberate, mm. and honestly think about why this is happening. Mm. Uh, because uh, if you look at the Ugandan, the Northern Civil War with mm. Kony, there were hidden agenda and all that. Mm. But as 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 Uganda was stood up. And I think we claim as a country that has the biggest and the most experienced army, then why are we failing to, 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 deal, to, with yeah, to deal with crisis. the Congo? Mm -hmm. uh, if the East African community all comes up and like, you know what, we are going to stand between this war. If they're deliberate about it, there wouldn't be any war going on. Uh, but I think there is something beyond what we see. Their interests, Their interests beyond the, what yes. we okay. see. And the fact that Kivu is a highly uh, you know, mineralized area, then I think it is beyond just a war. There is something going on. And nevertheless, we should also think about the people living in Kivu. Uh, as a feminist, to me, there's some, so many things I'll think about. Okay, men, the men are holding guns and fighting. Mm. How about the children? How about oh, yeah. the, 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 the mothers? Mm. You know, how are they being affected with this war? Then we should mm. rethink that. Mm. Is fighting over minerals and enriching ourselves more important than the lives of the people mm. staying in yes, Kivu? Yes. And it just explains why they would rather go back than be resettled. Because they have hopes. They had lives and future where, where they, they stay. Mm. So they are hopeful that it will end. But seeing that the allegations of you know different countries also mitigating yeah. and yeah. trying to add fuel to what is going on, then we need to ask our governments what it is that they, they're mm -hmm. interested in mm -hmm. and why is the war going on and we're not saying anything about it. Yeah, and, and maybe Dr. Sally, that is where I want you to pick up on. But most importantly, the role of international peacekeeping bodies. I think Congo has had the longest peacekeeping you know, initiative when it comes to dealing with war. But, and I'll draw, I, I want to do the comparison with Ukraine and the Ukraine and the Russia war and the mm -hmm. response that it has gotten from the international bodies and the war in Congo that has mm -hmm. been going on for such a long time with such a long peacekeeping initiative. Yeah. Why is there a semblance of no end when it comes to, you know, dealing with the rebel, the rebel territories or the rebel fighting that's happening within the Congo? Yeah, thank you very much. I think it is true that the Congo has had one of the longest running mm. civil wars. Mm. And it's quite obvious. I mean, there are a lot of books written about the yeah. Congo. Yeah. Congo has everything that everyone wants. Yeah. And the issues of the Congo are not just for surrounding governments. Yeah. The people with the biggest interest in the Congo are external. True. Mobutu has left when he had uh, given a lot of mining contracts. I mean, if you are to trace the Congo history right from King Leopold and yeah, rubber, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was the biggest producer of mm. rubber then. Then minerals are discovered. Mm. Lumumba tries to go communist. He's taken out. 
And for a long time, people have funded different as actors mm. in the Congo to fight. And there's nothing as just people fighting. Yeah. People fight over interests. Yes. There's nothing as just politics. Politics is about the organization of interests yes. and who secures those interests. So the interests in the Congo, mm. driven by what Congo has, mm. is global. It is True. world scale. True. So I think the matters of the Congo cannot just be left to neighboring governments. Mm. Because actually those we claim to see as international peacekeepers or international forces, the countries contributing to those forces are also the same countries with economic interests. Mm. In the Congo, sure. Mobutu had given a lot of mining contracts to US companies. Those who have succeeded him tried to change that balance of power mm. by giving them also to others. Mm. You had the Uganda and Rwanda and everybody fighting in Kisangani and the solution France did was to do Operation Diana and mine yes. all the yes. areas so that there's no access. Yes. Yes. So issues of the Congo are not issues just of the neighbors and the East African community. Mm. The biggest players and the biggest problem in the Congo are the so-called agents of peace mm. elsewhere in the mm. world. Mm. And uh, I think that has to be faced. But of course, I think as a government, the DRC itself has to work on reducing the opportunity for opportunists. Mm. Of course, you have the long-running co contracts overlapping, yeah. so that yeah, creates true. a challenge, mm. and people feel they still have a stake mm. where they didn't. And uh, she asked, where are the people in this whole equation of things, yeah. this whole schema of things? So what the DRC government needs to do is to develop that area, because yeah. as long as the area remains a jungle, it creates an opportunity yes. for players. Mm. I mean, we've seen videos of not just the Congo, but also the Central African Republic and Congo Brazzaville, mm. where international planes land in the middle of a forest, yeah. cut off what they yeah. need, and, and go. go. And yeah. they are not playing by the national rules and everything. So these countries are very big. Yeah. These countries have one of the biggest equatorial rainforests we yeah. need to protect. Yeah. So these countries need to be supported by bringing the actors mm. to account. Because globally, you can track which diamond came from which part yes. of the world. Yeah. Yes. You can track which gold is coming from there. Yeah. These financial flows are seen on the international market. Yeah. So those with resources should know and call those people to and, account. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, and until that is done, mm. we are going to see more and more people living. Because that's how people who do direct extraction do. Yeah. Their interest is to chase people off the mm. land mm. by financing wars. Like, so let, M23 let them be is out the first one. so that yeah. you can yeah. be mining. Before M23 we had the my mining yes. Before my mine we had other groups. Mm. At one time there was the, a towing of the idea of cutting the eastern DRC off. Is it wow. western or eastern? Yes, the eastern, eastern the one which neighbors yeah. us. So I think we are trying to, there is a time we had seven countries fighting out, fighting wow. it out in the Congo after Congo. Kabila won, mm -hmm. had taken power. So I think the issues of the Congo are everyone's issues. Everyone has to be held to account, but the biggest responsibility lies with the biggest beneficiaries, and those True. are the Western players. Mm. And then you asked a comparison with Ukraine. Yes. Of course, the way Ukraine has proceeded with Russia is also a different path. Yeah. in that Ukraine initially gets annexed to Russia from yeah. the 18th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And historically, Ukraine has said we are different. Yeah. And of course, at some point, it gets independence. But unfortunately, it gets independence. Ukraine is the, was the base of the USSR's yes. major military hardware mm. making factories. Mm. So it is armed to the teeth like Russia's yes. armed to the teeth. And maybe when people are equally armed to the teeth, people think twice before you start a yeah. war. Yes. So the Western world does not want any idea because of the fear that, and Russia has been clear, mm. they will not hesitate to use nuclear weapons. Mm. And if they ever do, I don't think they are going to do, but if they ever do, the whole of, the, of Europe is doomed. It's doomed. Yeah, it's we shall all be doomed, yes. but Europe will be More at the nearest. It is closer. Mm. So you have a war there which everyone is pampering all the actors yeah. to ensure yeah. that because the thing is close to the doorstep. Mm. But the same big players can cause havoc in it the also, Congo, yeah. because I it's know. very far. Yes. The Africans do not count. So they just extract and take, extract and take. Ukraine can fight it out with Russia because Ukraine had investments in infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. So they have these, like all USSR countries, they have these cities on top and cities below. Yeah. So everyone can survive. I think these countries need more development. The leaders in the DRC need to also do their part of the yeah. bargain. 
we know or we heard about previous leaders who who would fly children to go and study in Paris wow. and return in the evening. I mean, that, those are the stories which were told wow. about Mobutu. <laughs> we don't know whether they were true. But if you have leaders who don't care about developing your people, yeah. your people become collateral damage in the global rush for extractive minerals. Yeah. Mm. So I think that's what we are seeing. Mm. We've had Congolese refugees for as far back as we can remember. Yeah. Because true. they've always been thrown off the land. Yeah. Yeah, so. That, that these, you still have a local population in Eastern DRC is a testament to the resilience of the human of race. Of the human yeah. race. Yeah. Because I also actually went to school mm. with Congolese. Now they are resettled in the U.S. Yeah, they're in the U.S., they're in yes. Canada, they're all over the place. Yes. Yeah. But I remember that I knew Congolese even before I understood yeah. what the refugee crisis really looked like. And, and that speaks to what you were talking about when it comes to women and children. I watched a man frantically really speak about, you know, the impact it has on women and children if Nyakavande is closed. Mm. They're like, what you don't see is the human story in this crisis. is like mm. these women cannot survive. And if you're telling us to go to Nachi Valley, there is a lot at stake for us. Families have already been separated. Yeah. They don't know where their children are. And those that are with their children, their children must be either tired, frustrated, and emotionally. So... How are we not just even cushioning, but helping them thrive in this crisis, especially women and children? Mm. Thank you for that question. So um, I'll make reference to this weekend when I was taking some refugee women who are having a conversation with them. And there's one thing I noticed is they were saying, um, it is absurd, but this is their, their truth. Mm -hmm. They're like, our husbands were important people working in governments back home. Yeah. And so when we come to Uganda and you tell them to um, go and tembea in quotes, mm. uh, things, they cannot do it because they are used to doing civil life. Mm. So what is left of us as women, it's us to toil to ensure that we put food on the table. We can do any labor work mm. just to make sure that our families stay put. Some of us are widows with eight children, so we're supposed to take care of our children, mm. ensure that they have education and get alive. So to me, that spoke a lot to them. What do the men do? Because even if the men are there, it's still the women that take yes. care of them. So the effect the war has on women is continuous, not only during the war, Long after the long war. Long after the war, mm. even after they are resettled. Because I imagine even if they, they are resettled, they say to the US or the mm. Canada, it's mm. still the woman who's going to yes. you know look out yes. for the family. Yes. The effect it has. So moving them from Nyakabande to Nachivale still. How imagine a mother with eight children yeah. and are being moved. So how sure are you all of you are going to be moved to the same, mm -hmm. you know, settlement mm -hmm. area? And the the dispersion that comes with as a woman for where are my children? Because we've seen over the years. The war affects women differently yeah. from like different from how it affects men. Yeah. For a man, they can survive on their own. They wouldn't mind about children. But a mother cannot let her children. Yeah. Uh, she cannot even sleep or eat before her children does that. It really drastically affects them. And uh, this still explains on how much violence still the mothers and the women and the yeah. girls face yeah. from the other male counterparts. Yeah. Uh, if a woman is going to be a laborer, you know, provide domestic services. Mm the abuse that comes with, yeah. the GBV the issues, issues that comes, yeah. comes with, the defilement, the rape cases. Because talking to them, some are like, we get defiled, we get raped, but we cannot even report because we are refugees. We do not have that status like a citizen, you know, to, mm. be, to be able. We don't know which services are available for us. For we us, don't know true. which healthcare services we can go for. Some even claim that they're told to pay exorbitantly wow. for the Form 3, you know, for a police surgeon to really examine them and... Uh, determine whether it was a defilement or rape. So these issues uh, need to make us wake up as a country. I know yeah. UNHCR provides and takes care of, 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 of um, the refugees, mm -hmm. but then as a government with corruption and these issues that are coming up of making them pay to get mm -hmm. services that are supposed to be free, yeah. what are we doing as a country to make sure that uh, we have better policies, you know, streamlined to yeah. be able to help refugees? and make sure that they receive the services in the yeah. way that any other person would. Mm -hmm. With the human right aspect, not the fact that they're not citizens, yeah. but as humans, human beings, humans how do we protect mm -hmm. their rights and ensure that they're protected even in the community area that they're living mm -hmm. with, the, with the host communities?
that's interesting. Um, Dr. Sally, you spoke something about um, having infrastructure within these centers or within Congo. But um, as I said, yeah, I thought, yes, Congo has now joined the East African community as a seventh country. Mm -hmm. Congo has a presidency that is there. I mean, they have a president. They have a, almost like the political life in Congo seemingly looks like it's present. They I mean, they have a government. They are now part of the East African community, meaning there was a, there was a government in place that decided that's, that's a good step to take. And when you look at it in the in the geopolitical in the or in the Great Lakes region narrative, it almost feels like Congo as a country is existent. But then, how do we, you know, test the not just even the resilience, but the impact of this government that is in place within the Congo? Can it deliver beyond infrastructure? But can it also deliver to not just protect its citizens, but also to have Congo thrive? within the region. Because I'm imagining as the Great Lakes region or even as a South African region, every country is going to come with different in interests to the table to be able to benefit from, 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 the, from the East African region, from the East African community, from the different initiatives around identity, money, trade. How then can we have the Congo benefit from such a dynamic in the presence of such a narrative around it? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I think the Congolese government is working. Mm. Yeah, so Congo is a big country. Yes. It's more than five times the size yes. of Uganda. So we get to see what affects us. But the other parts of Congo are functioning like any other country. Mm. It has an education system, it has universities, it has healthcare systems. So it is functioning like any other country. Wow. But we can also not stop the fact we cannot fail to appreciate that there is a war in mm. the east because the of east. rebels. Mm. I mean, Uganda had a war in the north the for north. 26 years. Yeah, that never on. stopped to say that mm. the Uganda government is not working. Yeah. It was working. Yeah. It kept passing budgets. It kept looking after its people. So, we, so there is a war in the DRC. And when the DRC is because the forest cover, and this is where we need also to appreciate the geography, mm. yeah. the intense forest cover in the country with all the development on the Atlantic coast mm. and little in the east mm. is, I mean, is, is what is partly the problem. And I know the governments have tried, but one, they should not cut down the forest because that's very, True. very important yes. for climate yeah. and should not create climate change. Mm. But in these different places, they have big cities. These cities like Lumumba, Shikisanga, they are bigger than even Kampas. Mm. So it's not a backward country. It is just that it has so many people who are interested in playing. So you have to appreciate the effort that the, the government Congolese has. government yeah. is trying to do. Okay. But also when you have a war zone, when you have a war zone, you also have to know who gets to be the players in the war zone. Mm. Eastern DRC as a war zone has been under UNHCR for a very long yeah. time. And that's where most of the international peacekeepers are based. Wow. To ensure there are no human rights violations from the government. Mm. So you have the M23 period, so you had the Mai Mai, then you had the UN, mm. then peacekeepers, then you had the government forces, and then you had the neighboring mm. government forces. Mm. Yeah. So all the others we asked to pull out in favor of the UN. So the UN should be in touch with the DRC and do that. But of recent, you've had our government signing pacts yeah. with the DRC to try and create a road network and all of that, mm. to even allow Congolese to travel among themselves, their yeah. own communities. So it is costly and it's going to take time. But to go back to the Congolese refugee crisis, we should not only focus on Nyakabande. Yeah. Nyakabande was a transit camp. It was a transit camp. But out of the 12, I think 12 refugees settlements we have in this country, five of them are to Congolese refugees largely. Mm, wow. Whether you're talking about Rwamanja, mm. Chaka, uh, Nachivale, mm. Changwali, Chiriandongo, all these areas have are Congolese. largely Congolese. Yeah. Then you have the northern ones, mm. the Ajumani, Bidi, Bidi, Lamo, those are largely mm. South Sudanese. Sudanese yeah. So Congolese are coming in at different points, mm. okay? Some come from the other side, you land in the Ajumani side. When you come in from here in the middle, Lake Alubat, you land in the Changwari. And, and I know and Uganda Ramanda. has a borders Congo in, in a very long yeah, yes. 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 So what the government or what UNHCR is saying about Nyakabande is 
This a transit camp is simply a receiving yeah. space. We receive you, we you direct receive, you to other places. They process you mm. and you go. So I think if the way is still proceeding, it might be the safest thing for these people to accept to move. Yes. Mm. Because you cannot stay in a transit camp forever. True. Yeah. So the transit camp I think is going to remain open, but for a few for a number of days. Yeah. But it is also unfortunate that people want to stay. And we understand why they want to stay. It's a psychosocial matter. Mm. Yes. Because going beyond there is force is getting you to realize that there is no it point of return. No point of yeah. return. So that's the whole point. Yeah. But other than that, I think it's going to be a tough challenge. But I think the matters of the DRC are everyone's matters. Yeah. They cannot just be left to the DRC government. Yeah. But also the where the government is responsible is with the resources they have. They should actually be seen to do something for their people. Yeah. As I talked, the luxury of those who ruled before the current president yes. were inexcusable. Mm. We had the Mobutu, but also with Kabila too. By the time he left, everyone was I talking you, about I his wealth. You. <laughs> so with the resources, let us see more development for the people. Yeah. But I also don't know what the Congolese people are doing about it themselves because some of these things change when you yourselves take your Start own agency. Take, yes. 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 Start Start to fight Uganda your... is where it is because the Ugandan people of the so, time decided to fight to establish themselves. Yes. I think it may reach a point where the Congolese may have to do that. That's to see interesting. what they want. But of course M23 are Congolese and I think internationally it's not allowed for any rebel group to assert territory in another country, yeah. you will be bombarded. Yeah. That's just clear. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot start my rebel group in Kampala and say because and I don't say like, because the, affairs I don't like of, the affairs of Let Kampala. me look for a certain part of the country and pitch and camp there it. and try to create. You will be actually attracting trouble. Mm. Yes. That's interesting. We're going yes. to take a short break. But, but the thought that I'm taking, and it, it stuck with me, is that sometimes the internal conflicts may perhaps have solutions from the people. Yeah. And so it may be that internal conflicts need to meet internal objectivity for people to come and say, we'll fight this war out. And I hope that's a thought a Congolese out there can take. But anyway, for us ourselves, there are some yeah. things within us that ought to be able, it, it takes a Ugandan to figure out. There are many Congolese allies all over the world. Indeed. So some of these, even something as simple as what are these contracts holding us? Yeah. Yeah. Can we get to see yes. what they say so that we get an amicable solution for the people? No one is stopping people from extracting. If you have the technology and we don't have, yeah. you come and you extract the and oil. Then, and then but what are it. the benefits yeah. for the people yeah. and for the government? That's all we are saying. Thank you. Yeah. Let's take a break and come back. I welcome back. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment, and also continue these conversations in your networks because you know they're with us, they're part of our reality. So we need to have voices adding and chipping to how we can have a different narrative going forward. Um, while we're talking, I noticed that for some reason in the north, in the border areas of Uganda, we actually host more than one country as a nation. And these people have also started to assimilate within the region. Mm -hmm. And some have become urban refugees. Um, when we are planning, because we plan every year, we have a budget that comes out mm -hmm. and speaks to you know how we are going to survive as a country. But now these refugees have almost taken on the identity of Uganda and some of them. Is there a plan, and that is where you need to help me, because mm. I don't know, is there a plan that, that helps them then take on either citizenship or a dual citizenship, or now that these two, Sudan and also Congo, are part of the East African region, mm. can they thrive within the region as East Africans? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, when, with having a plan as a country to... Um, 
not allow people to assimilate and, you know, because there's so many people I've seen their IDs. Someone mm. has a Sudanese name and they have a national ID of Uganda and you're wondering, how, did how? they get this genuinely? Mm. Um, did they go, you know, and declare dual citizenship or what? Mm. I think that's a weakness on our side, uh, partly because we have the the best policies in relation to integrating the policy uh, that refugees yeah, in our country yeah. where they have freedom to move. So we find we have like South Sudanese who have been in, in Uganda for more than 10 years. I actually see South Sudanese cars more nowadays. Yes. Mm. So um, for me, I think, yes, if you look at our laws, we have a period on which you can stay in the country and become a citizen by using the formal way, you know, apply and then they look at your records and then the government will assess on whether to give you citizenship, which is okay. I think that's the citizenship by naturalization. It's provided for in our law. However, I don't think most of them do acquire their citizenship that way. Mm. And I think it's something that government will needs to look at. It's not only the Sudanese, the Congolese also, uh, people from Burundi, people from Rwanda, who have become citizens. And you question, are they citizens following the legal you know, way that is provided for? So our government needs to do better about that. But in the other hand is uh, these refugees come with skills. Yes. You know, the, some of them are doctors, some of them are lawyers, some of them are teachers. And if you look at our uh, situation right now in the country, we need more of skilled, skilled people, people in, yeah, to improve our service systems. For example, we need more doctors Taking the fact that we have so many doctors leaving our country, working in Kenya, yes. going in the Arab Emirates, uh, going mm. abroad to work for better pay. If we can integrate these in a formal, legal way. Isn't it a bad thing that we're having capital flight as a country? Because now we've also created our own problem. It is a bad thing. And I think the government needs to do better. We need to work on minimum wage for, you know, a national minimum wage. How much that looks like. Are people being exploited? People are being exploited in Uganda because you don't have a, a, a policy on the minimum wage and it's not being enforced that mm. someone has to be paid, let's say, $11 an mm. hour as the minimum wage. Mm. Do we have that in the country? No, we don't. Mm. What is the government doing about it? I don't know what they're doing about it. They need to wake up and do something about it. If nothing is done for a minimum wage to be uh, established in the country and everyone They'll keep enforcing living. it, people will keep living. Mm. Uh, the issues of trafficking that we're hearing now, that young people are leaving oh, yeah. and, you know, labor externalization. It's because mm. we don't have a policy in place to protect the citizens. And Congolese are coming in. Uh, the South Sudanese, the Rwandese, the Burundians are coming in in a system that is not streamlined. Mm. And they're taking advantage of that as a country. Mm. So we are finding in the border area that non-citizens are thriving yeah. when it comes to trade, when it mm. comes to uh, service provision, when it comes to... Uh, them being uh, laborers and providing services because they there's no minimum wage. So mm. they are working hard to be able to sustain themselves, mm. doing jobs that even the citizens will not do. Oh, yeah. And so we end up uh, not uh, being empowered or having the income that we need to as citizens because we have cheap labor coming in. Mm. And they, they are doing anything they can to, to make sure that... They, we don't have a policy saying if you're a non-citizen, you cannot take certain jobs. Mm. True. So they are infiltrating the, the economy and doing these jobs and earning. Mm. And then you find the poverty line for the refugees are getting better and for the citizens it's going, going down. Mm. So um, that is a problem that we need to do. However, still, I would not uh, say that we should, you know, block the refugees from accessing our economy or the labor service work because mm. these people come with services and sometimes the services they are bringing in for example let's say in a community we might not be having a doctor that's as experienced as this refugee doctor who has come and probably we might you know benefit from, from him, his services but now then which policies and laws are in place to ensure that this doctor who is coming in is coming to help and benefit the community and not for them to enrich themselves. And uh, allow me to pause you there because something came to my mind before I forget it. Is it possible that in the refugee camps that we have, the 12 refugee camps that we have and more, and also the, the people that live in the host communities as well, is it possible that instead of having temporary structures, mm -hmm. we build towards a sustainability that, that empowers or gives urgency to the refugees to actually build better? have real homes, have real settlements, build homes, whereas they can always live, but 
so that we don't have, you know, areas within our region left as tents and camps. Yeah, they're there. They're there. Yeah, they're there. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give reference to Chiriandongo because mm -hmm. that's the camp I worked in. Uh, when I went to First time I went to Chirandogo, this is what I had in my mind. I'm going to see so many tents. Tents. That's, and that's, that's it. That's in my head. So I was shocked to see permanent structures, oh really my. homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, like where we were living, uh, where I was working, there are homes owned by South Sudanese, like really beautiful yes, permanent homes. Mm -hmm. And then there are even um, like jobs, shops, hotels owned by them. And I'm, I was thinking, okay, so this is not the perception I had. Mm -hmm. And I hardly saw any tents, to tell the truth. In the refugee yeah. camp and they stay in clusters so you find homes in different clusters like wow. permanent structures mm -hmm. even small farms to provide food uh, mm -hmm. for them as a kind uh, as, as people mm -hmm. so i think chirendongo is one of the developed refugee camps that has I, really I think, integrated people i think it all goes back to what uganda's refugee policy is yeah. mm -hmm. and you next year of course chirendongo is one of the oldest dates mm -hmm. to 1944 mm -hmm. but and bdb is the youngest but mm -hmm. all of these refugee camps what is our refugee policy they are given land, land allotments, yes. and they build, wow. and they stay, mm. and they have camp commanders. So the OPM has a structure to make these people belong. And that's why if they are being moved from Nyakavandis, because they are being taken to this place. So they get I know somewhere refugees that here good. who work as tailors, but their homes are in Nachivali. Wow. So he or she tells you over the weekend, I'm going home to see my family. Mm. The kids are going to school in those refugee yes. camps. And sometimes the refugee camps have actually better resources than, mm. than the host ideas. community. And that's yes. part of the conflict, mm. the issues of resources and the issues of environmental mm. degradation. Mm. So I think the policy is in that, I think maybe we could have, should have been informed by the policy that the OPM provides mm. for all structures these people to be. And the, I have been able to do in 2019, 2020, we did studies in the four refugee camps, mm. Bidi Bidi, Changwali, Chiriandongo, mm. and Nachivale. Mm. And you do find there are services there. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So on the, on the, the other thing, but also I think we need to guard is to imagine that every foreigner is a refugee. Oh, that's true. Many foreigners <laughs> are living in these cities and they are and not they are refugees. refugees. Yeah, yeah because we open up. Yeah. to foreigners who mm. are going to be beneficial mm. to the community. And every country in the world does that. True. If you're a rich Ugandan who is going to take resources into a London bank, you'll be allowed there. You don't have and to come to be a refugee. refugee. Mm. Yeah, mm. so... You can even be given citizenship. <laughs> yeah, even if you're not given, you can yeah. just be given settlement. You yeah. actually do not even need to get citizenship. Citizenship is for voting. Yeah. But... We lived in these places mm -hmm. without even the citizenship. You're entitled to the NHS. Mm -hmm. You're entitled, you can get a job. You can get, what distinguishes you from being a citizen in the UK is that Voting. you vote. Mm -hmm. And we didn't need to vote. So yeah. we didn't even need, need to get their, their cards their and whatever. Cards, yeah. You live there, you mm -hmm. live. So if you have something useful to do, you get to do it. And I think that's why when we talk about foreigners even having NINs, of course, that's a problem because the NINs should be for citizens. Yeah. Yes. But uh, other than that, there are many foreigners who are living larger than Ugandan, because yeah. actually they are living on their own money. Mm. It's not necessarily our money. Mm. But as we discuss these things and recommend for the government, I think it all goes back to the development path yes. our government took. Mm. When in 1987, or even, even before the previous governments, we signed up to the World Bank system of the privatization. privatization, the privatization. It reduced the, the government to providing peace and security and an enabling environment. And nothing after that. Nothing after that. So in a way, it gave the governments an opportunity to abdicate responsibility yeah, yeah. from their people. Yeah. So that's why you have the situation she's talking about. Many doctors are produced, not all of them can be absorbed. Mm -hmm. So they leave. They're not going to be there waiting for you. True. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are many jobs. You have to create your own job you have because to the formal sector job. cannot mm -hmm. absorb all of us. Mm -hmm. And if you, a Ugandan, you choose to sit, and the Congolese decides to sow, that's I mean, a that is it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So either yeah. Ugandans are going to become tailors, or the Congolese are going to become tailors, and they had better do good tailoring, not this tailoring where you walk, and the tailor runs away when they see you. The thing we are debating is the same thing you have in Europe, where people in the UK and the rest don't want immigrants from the former Soviet republics, mm. they don't want Poles. But what are these people coming to do? And of course they don't want Africans. What are these people coming to do? They are driving Domino Pizza trucks, they are cleaning, they... you're not going to find locals wanting to do they're these jobs. To do those yeah. jobs. They're not into care. Yeah. And the country is saying, look here, we need these services. True. What are we going to do?
If you just go to the oil wells in uh, Hoima, mm -hmm. you don't have Ugandans who can drive forklifts. You don't have wow. drive of Ugandans who want to do driving, who want to do. So at the end of the day, most of they the laborers mm -hmm. are Kenyan. Yeah. Okay. You oh, go to Bidiko here, mm -hmm. in, uh, what, what is this place? Kalangas. Mm -hmm. Ugandans don't want to dig up things to plant palms. They imported Kenyan labor. So there's something we need to do as a country Just and as a people. So simply feeling large and claiming entitlements mm. won't, take us, won't far. take us far. But also going back to the topic is that if refugees have skills, let them let be them allowed. Be. Yeah. Yeah. Because the services they're being provided for by UNHCR and by our government is Can limited. Yes. Yes. Of course, I would be cautious about a, fo a foreign doctor coming in and working on the people. Mm -hmm. They need to go through a licensing mm -hmm. system. Yes, yes. But there are basics that mm -hmm. they can do. But beyond that, our government should plan better for its people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have a ticking time bomb. Sure. Where you have nationals mm -hmm. who are not accessing resources, and you have foreigners accessing resources, you'll end and up with the war. Conflict yeah. There. Yeah, you'll end up with conflict. Yeah. That's interesting. In, in our, as we wind down this conversation, it, there's a lot of take-homes to have. Mm -hmm. One, does our government system work? Does the foreign policy of, of between these regions also work? But not even just working. How do we, you know, share the burden within the region? How do we, especially, and, and I want to really bank on the East African cooperation and East African community, with the narrative that we want to open our borders, with the narrative that we are now East African before we are Ugandan, before we are Congolese, before we are Sudanese, how do we, you know, absorb this influx within the region? Is there a time where we can have other East African countries take on different entities, different refugees what they are doing. within? The Baido is one of the biggest refugee camps on the continent. Mm. It is in Kenya. Interesting. Mm. Yes. So do they have people from the Congo and people from Yes. Sudan. Actually, yes, even do. for Uganda, what I didn't say is that we only don't have Congo and Sudanese. We have Somali. We oh, have no, Rwanda. We, have, we have Burundi. We have Eritreans. Ethiopians. We have Djiboutians. We mm. have so many. So all these countries are having so many refugees living with them. Actually, it's Africa's biggest problem. Africa's biggest problem. Yeah, and uh, of course with that, going back to the gender question, is it comes with a lot of violence for yeah. the women. She articulated that. Nachivale tried to have a Sasa model, which actually showed the different kinds of violence they meet. Apart from the sexual, the physical assault, mm. they also have things like taking out their property. Because they've settled yes. in a place for a long yes. time. They have built wealth. So you have a propagation of what occurred in the society being carried on into mm. the camps with their spouses. Mm. So that needs to be looked into. There are the issues of services. Mm. Each Service time you look at delivery. any refugee camp, you see long lines of jerry cans of water. Yes. Yeah. For some reason, of course, refugee camps are situated in places with the worst temperature. Worst temperatures, yes. Yeah, so they are largely drought areas, mm. apart from Nachi Valley, which has a high water table mm -hmm. and has flooding. And for that reason, they can't construct proper Toilets. Toilets, yeah. The rest have a water scarcity matter. And because of the rocks being closed, like mm -hmm. BDBD, BD, mm -hmm. you know, finding, being able to dig even a mm -hmm. deep hole mm -hmm. for a pit latrine, it's drink, quite hard. Mm -hmm. sinking boreholes, mm -hmm. it's quite hard. Mm -hmm. And occasionally having raids mm -hmm. from the Sudanese government, yes. but also having different camps or cliques in the country making their way into the country into yeah. the camps. Mm. Like if you're from different fighting groups mm. and you, you all end up in the, the same in the same camp. Then <laughs> the same problem yes. continues. Yes. So I think those are issues we need to pay attention to. So the countries need to pay attention, but I think they are all having issues of poor economies. Mm. But other than that, we also need to pay issues of violence because yes, war violence brings out the most toxic side of masculinity mm. on every side and there are no social controls and mm. there's no social protection you just need to look at our figures after the first lockdown mm. the numbers of teenage pregnancies in mm. these camps the numbers of suicides in these mm. camps mm. for even the men mm. and all this kind because sometimes I, conflict I think actually someone both. said violence is is a war language and that violence comes with rape all these other rare, even it goes with the right to life. Physic, yeah. The first thing war does is to suspend human rights. Yes. So if I, I care about you because I think you're a person, you're a person. Hey. but if After for some that, reason I've, I decide to not mm, see you as a person mm, mm. 
And there are many things we use to deface yeah. humans. Yeah, true. You either don't like their religion, you don't like their tribe, they you, they like you don't like their the color. <laughs> so you use all of these things to make that person of less of a human being. Yes. Mm. Then it becomes easy, easy to violate to them, violate them. Yeah. even yeah. to kill them, even to take their right to life, mm. to take their right mm. to property. Mm. Because you've already dealt with your psyche. That actually I'm not dealing with yes. a person. I'm dealing with something less like than a human being. So, so you've taken so another human face that, to it. Then everything goes. Mm. So as you continue with these kinds of these discussions, you also need to look at some of these statistics mm. and a lot of it explains that. Mm. And sometimes even after the conflicts, after the wars, yes. you have long periods of conflict, of violence in these communities mm. before they settle. Mm -hmm. And Naima, let me bring you into this conversation when it comes to women mm. and you know, war and crisis, women and children suffer the most. They're the ones left to carry the bag yeah. long after, during and long after the war. How can we, as, as not just even the, the, the UNHCR, but also civil society, mm -hmm. support women differently when it comes to issues of, you know, economic empowerment, when it comes to addressing violence, yeah. when... Even going into, I think one of the conversations I would have, I would love to have in the next 16 days of activism would be on dealing with violence against refugees, yeah. in particular women and children. How do we address that? How do we, you know, empower them, give them agency in, in the state of crisis they find themselves in? Okay, thank you very much for the question. I think our women is an, an important conversation to have. Uh, in regards to specifically women, women refugees. Mm. As a women's movement, we have focused more on driving the agenda of women, yeah. the Ugandan women. Yeah. But uh, these women live in Uganda and uh, there is nothing yes. for us without all of us. Yeah. So refugee women need to be put in the agenda for you know uh, the women's movement, specifically in relation to gender-based violence. With the 16 days of activism coming up, um, I was talking yesterday to a refugee woman and she was telling me, I'm a Somali woman, you know, the way we dress. When I wear a skirt and a blouse, all the women come with knives to attack me, saying mm. that I'm misrepresenting the culture. So then I'm thinking, who is culture? Mm. Then how do we have to protect this woman from violence, you know, mm. uh, being attacked by her fellow people? Uh, so I'm thinking the first thing we should do is uh, the refugees have refugee-led CSOs yeah. where they deal with their issues. Yeah. I understand the issues of uh, language barrier is very important because uh, maybe you speak English, someone from Somali only knows yes. their language, yes. Arabic, a Congolese might not understand, you know, English and Uganda, they know Francais and Congolese mm. or Swahili. Mm. Mm. And now I appreciate the fact that as Uganda and Swahili is our second national language, mm. uh, so we need to explore more about uh, how to communicate to the refugees. Yeah. If we can all speak Swahili as an East African community, then it gives us a point of relation. And uh, we need to now include them in our agenda, especially with GBV. Most of them face challenges if they report these GBV issues, because the leaders like, I reported the police, the police told me to go back. If they attack again, I go and report. Mm. That is not a solution she needs. What if her life is in danger? Mm. Then do we have to take her back? Uh, to, to, to danger, danger is, is. Yeah. so um i think we need to tackle issues to do with how do we give and provide services that can help the refugee women access justice and access you know uh, health if they're to report an issue of let's say defilement rape to the police how are we helping them to ensure that they get the services that they need to mm -hmm. as women not refugees, but as women, mm. to make sure that they are protected, their, their rights are protected as women, they're not facing violence as women, yeah. and their children uh, at the same time. So as women's organizations, let's look out for uh, those organizations that are refugee-led, that are dealing with GBV, because there's so many of them. I've heard of ANGEL, I've heard of REAL. Mm. Uh, there's so many organizations of, led by refugees that I did not know about, mm. and big organizations like, let's say, FIDA, UNET, UGANET, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the CSOs that deal with women issues, should partner with these organizations yeah, yeah. and see how then can they provide the services yeah. that they do provide for an everyday woman to the refugee women. I think that's the best solution. It's shocking that they do not know about these major organizations that we have in, in Uganda. They have never heard about it, and it's because maybe they've experienced trauma dealing with uh, some certain organizations in the pretext of helping women. Yes. So we need to come up straight, form intentional uh, partnerships, partnerships with the refugee-led mm. organizations and see how then we can provide them, help them uh, access these services, help them 
uh, deal with trauma, help them provide, because Uganet provides, uh, I think, services that mm -hmm. trauma led. We have refugees who are women that are dealing with HIV. Yeah. How then do we partner with this organization yeah. to ensure that they get the services that they need? Uh, and, and your answer also deals with intersectionality. Yeah. Too, because a lot of times when we speak about women, we are speaking about able-bodied women, Ugandan women, and we forget there are women who are also refugees, who most probably also have HIV, yeah. who most probably need mental health care. Uh, and I love that when, when we speak about, you know, lensing out and helping them, we then don't look at just a single issue that they're refugees, yeah. but they're women with all these other issues. Dr. Sally, let me bring you there. Mm. Um, you've done extensive work around refugee women. And I know for a fact, a lot of the, the, the aid that comes in, comes in to deal with the immediate. Yeah. It's like you need settlement, you need, to, you, know, you need somewhere to stay, you need food. So we'll give you that. But how do we empower them? To, to you know to find urgency to be able to move on and not just move on and forget that but move on enough for them to survive okay yeah thank you very much the actually a lot has been done in this country yeah. beyond the mental health so the work we've done with the different refugee camps i mean for us we're doing research find out yes. what is there yes. so as to develop a population yeah. health and environment mm. framework mm -hmm. for refugees one of the things we found out is in addition to the services that are being provided, not sufficient, mm -hmm. and we're asking for more, we want more social services, as she said, yes. sometimes partnering with other organizations if those who are mandated to help them don't have don't enough. Have yeah. enough. Yeah. So you need others to come in. And I think the other thing we have to battle with is the social norms. Mm. Oh, yeah. As she gave the example of the Somali woman and uh, you see people have come in their, you know, the more you're translocated from your place, the more you feel threatened to lose your culture, yeah, the more true. you hold on yes. to it. So where these people are in the different camps, they watch out for each other. Maybe not very much the Congolese and the rest of the mm. laser fair people, mm. but for communities like the Somalis, they are, who have a different culture from us, mm. people are scared of losing that. So they police each other. To ensure that you're having those norms. Yeah. But also the general norms of male superiority and yeah. everything. And by the way, this affects refugees two ways. There is the, and it's good you talked about intersectionality, mm. there is predisposing women to violence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it also predisposes men to violence. Oh, interesting. Yeah, if you look at what has been happening in the Great Lakes mm. Wars, mm. the unique thing about the Great Lakes Wars is sexual abuse of men. Interesting. And there are documentaries made about mm. it. Mm -hmm patriarch against men. Mm -hmm. And some of the people we deal we have to deal with as urban refugees who are very depressed and whatever are men. Amen. They're not even seeking care. They're just in the house and someone doesn't want to open. I mean, because if you're sodomized by whichever group that mm -hmm. fought, uh, if you were raped and now your wife tells you, okay, for me, the rape occurred, but as a woman, I grew up to expect it. Now yeah, you yeah. have been raped, so are you still a husband to me? I hear you. And then she leaves. Mm. Or even when they were in the DRC camps and these men tell you stories of when they went to report rape, the UN camp is like, oh, 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 oh it's so sad that it happened yeah, to you. Victimized. It is so hard it happened to you, but we are set up for women. I mean, so. Not for men. So the men fall through the cracks yeah. and so that. So those are some of, and why are the men being targeted? Because it's the way to break the spirit of a group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, yeah, sad that women do get raped. That one we've known historically. Yeah, yeah. So now the new skill of raping men is a way to really break the spirit of the and fighting forces. Mm. And it does mm. break. So as we talk about women's mental health, we also need to talk about men's mental health. Beyond that, are the just use of things that what radicalizes males and brings out the mm. worst mm. form of male mm. toxic, mm. I mean, toxic masculinity. Yes. We have some projects we have been dealing with in northern Uganda, not necessarily on refugees, but on former IDPs, mm. to try and make the men less violent. I hear you. Yeah, because how do people react to a thing beyond, I mean, we can disagree with her and disagree with her very badly. But sometimes if we've all been charged yes. to deal with disagreement differently, we can actually disagree very, very, very badly yes. with mm -hmm. very bad consequences. So all these things need to look into. But one of the other things I found happening in the camps especially the refugee camps, mm. is they are not just being given health care and water and relief. Mm. In addition to the allotments they are given to dig for themselves, they have also been given skills, 
Small like yeah, tailoring, small, small entrepreneurship yeah, yeah. things. Of course, yeah. we ask mm. for more, mm. but there's something they have circles mm. where they collect their money together, yeah. and the the OPM needs to be pushed to bring more empowerment things so yeah. that people end up leaving the mm. camps. Mm. And I think as long as they have that, then they can dream of a life yes. beyond, beyond being mm. dependent. None of us wants to be a recipient of aid. Yes. That in the morning you wake up with your bowl, then, then you. beans portion, mm. and you eat and sleep, and tomorrow you wait. I think human beings are, are wired for work, work, for doing something for yeah. themselves. So if this opportunity, if you go to the camps, there's, you must have seen this charcoal burning, mm -hmm. this tailoring, mm -hmm. they're selling these small, small things, small retailers. Mm -hmm. So it shows you that if they actually had financing, they would do more they will do more. Mm. Of course, with regard to assimilation, there they are things which, happen, which are happening in that their kids can get access to schools. Mm. And as I said, the problem is sometimes their schools are better than ours, and yes. that creates a conflict. Mm. But I've seen like at university, whether you're dealing with MasterCard or whatever, there are quotas for refugee kids. Yes. And maybe that will help them excel. Uganda for long, if you find more many Sudanese gab mm. Sudanese doctors abroad who mm. are black Sudanese doctors who are in their 60s I've and 50s. If you ask them where they went to school, it will be Chisubi. Yes. Mm. It will be Wundo. Mm. It will be mm. Makere. Mm. Okay. It will mm. be Makere. Mm. So we've had a history of integrating people. Yeah. The only thing we need to ask is when these people went through our systems and were given the opportunity and they went and excelled on the platform, what are they bringing them back home? Mm. So it's good to be in those countries and carry foreign passports, but yes. your identity still remains African. Yeah. So you need to do something. And I imagine if the Congolese in the diaspora demanded for more from their governments, mm. formed what we have the equivalent of the Uganda oh, North America, yes. and did something, yeah. those kinds of things, mm. the governments, whether in Uganda or Sudan, should respond better mm. than just saying, oh, Africa is a gone case. Mm. But the issue of women, women do suffer a lot, because when a war takes place or when you're a refugee, your domestic roles do not end. No, they don't. The child will cry and the child will mm. want food. Mm. If you're in squalid conditions, you are exposed to violence. Sometimes even the males in those homes have left. Mm. Sometimes, like for the Ugandan IDPs, who are what we are tracking in northern Uganda is when they went back and their husbands died during the 26-year period, the home where you were married doesn't want you because your yeah. husband died. Yeah. The home they where you came that. from, they say we gave you away. Give you away. So there are all those things we need hmm. to focus on. Yeah. Excuse my I also know that the sum, especially for us who now know that the, also the, 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 the war in the north took away land from them. So you would come back where your home was. I like this, is not your land. And yeah. so you're landless, you're homeless. And, and you identity have... is important. Yes. Having a sense of belonging somewhere, even if you don't go there, but having a sense of belonging is very important. I remember some yeah. of them actually taken as child brides. So they had uh, children with fathers that they don't know, like men they don't know, mm -hmm. they were army men. Mm -hmm. So coming back with a child who is fatherless, yes. clanless, yes. It, you're stigmatized, yes. uh, well, we don't know yeah. where this, ch this child is. So there's no sense of belonging for the children. Yes. Mm -hmm. They don't know where they lie. For one of my MA students mm -hmm. did that on the returnees of Northern of Uganda Northern with Uganda. the children, mm -hmm. the Aboke girls. Mm -hmm. And the family, of course, every family was happy that their child survived and is coming back. And of course, some of the children are coming back after 10 years. Yes. And the family is like, yeah, we are happy to have you back, but not that with that thing child. you're carrying. Yeah. That is because so. these are langis, and mm. they felt they were assaulted by acholis, and mm. their girls were mm. taken. So the girls not just coming from a, a fatherless group. The child is the child of the enemy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we are ready to have you home, but, but not, the stigmatization now the child not with face. that. So oh. at the end of the day, if you went in the initial aftermath, apart from because they would go through the Rachel Center mm -hmm. and then they would be resettled. So you'd find now these girls because they th their argument was, I can't it is my child, child who mm -hmm. kept me alive. Mm -hmm. When I was taken, I was ready to die. Mm -hmm. The day I became a mother, I, I be decided. To I survive. determined to survive, mm. and that is the reason I became resilient. And I'm here. So the two of us are stuck together, me yeah, and my child. Me so they leave child. home, and then they be pitch to do some odd things mm. around the rat town. Yeah. By then, I don't know what has happened now, mm. but that became the trajectory. But we also had issues where children who had killed were not wanted back in the community. Oh, wow. Because the children your were made mother. to kill yes. your murderers and they were young and they used to be placed in these homes where they're just children. And in one case, there's a woman who kept calling these children killers because mm. she had lost family wow. to these people. Mm. But the children had been part 
of this war. And one day these children, and they were young children, they were 12, 13, those kinds of things. Mm. They killed her. You're not kidding. And when they were asked the issue, she's always calling us murderers. We so never fought to what? fight. So what I'm trying to show, I mean, the stories are very many. The issue is that conflict, refugee status, create problems. Repo Real problems, mm -hmm. which will be with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the best case scenario would be to stop the issues. Yes. And that's where now the cause, that's where civil society yeah, becomes yeah. Very, important. very important. Because civil society, by its very nature, holds governments accountable. Yeah. Yeah. So we hope your partners in the DRC are asking the DRC government, why, why, what why? What is the end to this? I yeah. mean, we can't be like this forever. Yes. Yeah, and right. I think uh, in this, like with uh, refugee issues and giving them the best services, the civil society needs to stand up. The Ugandan and Kenyan civil societies need to hold the DRC civil societies accountable so that they can hold the governments ac accountable. Probably mm. that's when we can realize Have better services. Even Have your civil society can talk to your partners in the DRC. There must yes. be an action in the international. must be <laughs> able to do You that. might be have to say that <laughs> in Kinshasa at one of that's these conferences. True. Hopefully yes. you yeah. have the opportunity. We pray. Yes. Yes. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> uh, before I go into another Pandora of whether the civil society still has a that voice. That will be another day. <laughs> that will be another day. She has a voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us in this conversation. It's, it's quite a somber conversation but it also brings urgency to us to start to ask the deeper questions of what can we do. Yes. I hope in our elements, wherever we are, in civil society, in government, in private sector, in research, we can you know, start to interrogate different questions on how we can have, you know, a seemingly peaceable country or peaceable region going forward. Thank you. I've been your host, Trisha Gloria Navai. Have a good day and see you in the next show. Mm -hmm.